and welcome to Physician Focus, a production of the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin, your host. Is this an especially bad year for ticks? Everyone seems to say yes. There are even more ticks around than usual. You probably know that deer ticks are responsible for spreading Lyme disease, and that if this disease isn't treated, it can be serious. You may also know that Massachusetts is one of the states most heavily affected by Lyme disease. In fact, every year in Massachusetts is a bad tick year. In this program, we'll talk about the best ways to avoid getting bitten by a tick that may be carrying Lyme disease, and what to do if a tick does bite you. Later in this episode, I'll be talking with the doctor and scientist who discovered Lyme disease about what happens if we get exposed or infected. First, I went to a different expert and asked for some tips and tricks that can reduce our risk of being bitten by a tick. Dr. Catherine Brown is Deputy State Epidemiologist and State Health Veterinarian at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. It's her job to track diseases that are spread by ticks and mosquitoes and to teach us how to avoid those diseases. I'm talking here with uh, Dr. Katie Brown, who is the tick expert from the Mass Department of Public Health. Uh, nice to have you with us, Katie. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here, Bruce. Um, so why did they choose a veterinarian <laughs> to be the, uh, the tick master? Yeah, you know, I think I get that question a lot from people. It, it's, it's sort of easy to understand why there might be doctors and nurses practicing public health and maybe a little less clear why a veterinarian would be. But if you think about it, a lot of diseases either can be transmitted between people and animals or both animals and peoples get them. And so that's why um, it's important to have a veterinarian and have that subject matter expertise at the department. This becomes particularly important when we talk about Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases because it's the animal cycles that we have the most to worry about, I understand. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Um, Ticks uh, rely on um, many species of animals to uh, complete their life cycle, you know, to, to get food from so that they can survive. And we as humans and some of our pets are actually where they get some of their food sources. Why are we talking about ticks in particular? <laughs> as we discuss this? Well, so this is really um, peak tick season or part of peak tick season in Massachusetts. We're unfortunate here in Massachusetts in that really we have ticks that can be active all year round. Um, but there is definitely a peak season, kind of May to August or September. And that's when we see the most uh, exposure by ticks. And it's really because it's part of the tick life cycle. Um, when the young ticks first come out in you know, May um, and they're, <laughs> they're out looking for food, um, and that's when we start to see disease transmission to humans. What are we talking about in terms of ticks? There are all sorts of uh, tick sizes and uh, how do I tell that this tick is the one that's really going to be a, a nasty one? Yeah, so we do actually have uh, several kinds of ticks in Massachusetts, but we really only worry about one kind in terms of disease transmission, um, and that's the black-legged or deer tick. Um, and so I do have um, sort of a little display for you which shows exactly how tiny those ticks are. Um, and this is an example. So this is actually a larger species of tick, the American dog tick. So you're talking about a quarter inch maybe. A, a quarter inch maybe. And this is unfed before it has you know, drunk someone's blood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so this is the dog tick, not the one that we worry about in terms of disease. This is um, a, an adult black-legged deer tick. And really we talk about them. So you're them, talking half the size of yep. the other tick. We talk about them as being about the size of a sesame seed. Um, and then the one we really have to worry about, that young stage of the tick that I talked about, the nymph stage, they're really only kind of poppy seed size. So they can look like a speck of dust when you see them. Where, where do the ticks hang out and, and how do I keep them from transferring to my clothing and then crawling wherever they crawl? So ticks actually like 
damp, shady areas, and they're also ground dwelling. So they live in um, vegetation um, and under leaf litter close to the ground. Um, but I also think people tend to think of ticks as really only being in forested areas, and that's a mistake. In Massachusetts, unless you're right in the middle of like Commonwealth Ave, you know, the concrete jungle, the ticks really can be found almost everywhere. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at myself uh, after I've had my walk in the woods and I see a quarter inch tick crawling on me, not stuck to me. You're saying pretty much, you know, uh, flush it and be done with it and don't worry. I mean, I think I would say that for any kind of tick that you see just crawling on you, because really the tick has to attach and feed in order for any potential disease transmission or exposure to occur. So if you see any size of tick crawling on you, just brush it off and move on. So how do I protect myself? How should I protect myself? going out in the woods. I probably haven't been doing this. I really do think that everybody wishes there was a kind of one magic bullet, a simple solution that would enable us to just kind of get rid of this tick problem that we have in Massachusetts. But that just doesn't exist. That magic bullet doesn't exist. And so there's really two steps um, of things that we recommend for folks uh, to help prevent or at least reduce the risk of disease. And they're divided into things you would do before you go outside and then things you would do when you come back inside. So the most important thing to think about when you're going to go outdoors um, is to think about, are you gonna be in an area where there are ticks? And I would say most of Massachusetts meets that category. And then you wanna think about using um, a tick repellent um, that contains an EPA registered active ingredient. All right, so how do I know it's EPA registered? Yeah, you know, they don't make it really easy for you to find that information. And so what I'm gonna show you is that when you look at the very small print at the bottom of the label, it will say EPA reg, and then there will be a number. Um, kind of maybe a better way to think about this, um, or a better way to, um, to prepare for going shopping for a tick repellent is to go online. There are some very good tick repellent selector tools, um, one in particular from the National Pesticide Information Center, and they will really help you narrow down what type of repellent you want based on um, what you need to be protected from, ticks or mosquitoes, and then how long you're likely to need protection. For ticks, the best two products are really um, those that contain DEET or permethrin. And it's often best to use both of them because DEET is designed to be used on exposed skin to help reduce you know, um, where a tick might attach. And permethrin is designed to be used on clothing or shoes. And the advantage to permethrin is it'll actually kill the tick. So you're kind of getting back at them a little uh -huh. bit. <laughs> now, is this on the uh, uh, website at, uh for the DPH? Absolutely, we have a whole page dedicated to you know how to protect yourself. We even have a very simple fact sheet which talks about picking repellents. So that's mass, www.mass.gov slash mosquitoes and ticks. That's a good way to get to it. Um, so now we've, we've done all we can to repel those uh, little monsters. Before you go outside. Before we go outside. Now I've gone outside. Now what do I do? All right. So when you come in after you've had a long day of hiking or playing or gardening or whatever it is you've done, um, there's a couple of things that you can do to, again, help reduce your risk. One of the first things to do is to think about taking off those clothes that have been out with you in the environment. And there was a recent study that showed if you throw your clothes in the dryer on high heat for about 10 minutes, it will kill those ticks. And so anything that might still be crawling on your clothes, it's dead. Um, if you think about going ahead and taking a shower, within about two hours after coming inside, you'll rinse off any unattached ticks and that shower will give you a chance to do what we really strongly recommend, which is your daily tick check. And that's where you wanna make sure that you run your hands over every part of your body, feeling for kind of a little bump that um, might uh, be an attached tick. Oh my gosh, I found a tick. Yeah. If you find a tick and it's just crawling there, as you said, 
don't worry, brush it off, it, it's not going to do anything. But now I found one that's attached. Right. So what do I do now? Okay, well the first answer is don't panic. <laughs> the longer the amount of time they're attached to you, the greater the chance that you're going to be exposed to some disease. It's really important to go ahead and remove that tick promptly and properly. Kind of the standard recommendation is to go ahead and use just tweezers that have you know fine points on them and you grasp that tick as close to the skin as possible and then pull straight up firmly don't twist and just pull it out. And then here's another type of tool that I know a lot of people like to use. It has sort of a notch in it. It's a spoon it's with a, a notch. It's a spoon with a notch. Um, and then you would kind of put that notch underneath the tick close to your skin and then pull up the same way. It's, it's very interesting to see these tools for mm. removing ticks. Um, patients come in with all these strange ideas on how to get rid of ticks. <laughs> Your patients are going on Google too much, I think. So <laughs> there are, um, there's a lot of uh, information out there about you know the best way to remove ticks. And the problem with most of them is that what they end up doing is actually irritating the tick. And when you irritate the tick, um, you actually encourage it to regurgitate into the feeding site, and you're more likely to be exposed to one of the diseases so the it's quick carrying. Pull. Quick pull using simple tools is really the the, the safest way to remove best ticks. Best way to do it. Base, best and safest. And uh, so now, do I worry? What what is the danger? I'm, I've got an engorged tick. How often does do I get Lyme disease from that? Well, so we don't specifically know the answer to that, but I can absolutely tell you that not all ticks in Massachusetts are infected. Um, and so there's a, you know, a, a, a decent chance that you weren't exposed to anything at all, even if the tick was attached for a while. And even if it's infected and, itself. And even if it's infected itself. And so um, at that point, once you've removed the tick, you want to make sure that you identify it as a black-legged tick as opposed to the dog tick, the larger dog tick, which doesn't really carry disease in Massachusetts. If you identify it as a deer tick, black-legged or deer tick, um, then the next step is to go ahead and call your doctor. Um, and they may recommend just a symptom watch, looking for uh, a rash at the site of the bite or fever, um, or they may, may recommend a short course of antibiotics to help prevent you from getting sick at all. Both approaches are fine. You still look for that rash because if one tick bit you, that means that you've been exposed to an area that has other ticks. That's actually a really good point, Bruce, and I'm glad you reminded me about that. So, you know, most people that we talk to who have ha been diagnosed with Lyme disease actually don't remember a tick bite. So when you find a tick on you, that's actually, you're kind of fortunate, all right, because you know the kind of the area of the body that you want to watch for the rash. Um, but you have to remember that you may have missed another tick on your body. Um, Two Weeks earlier. Two weeks earlier, yeah. even if you're doing the tick checks the way um, you should be. But so part of the thing is to always look for for a rash if you've got yep. a bite with an expanding lesion. Absolutely, you look for it. And you know if you develop some type of a fever-based illness during the summer and you know that you've been out in areas where you're likely exposed to ticks, then it's something you should tell your doctor about. As we heard, we can take a few simple steps to reduce our risk of getting Lyme disease. But what if we're not always so vigilant? Or what if we do everything right and are just unlucky enough to be exposed anyway? I put those questions to Dr. Alan Steer. Dr. Steer is the physician and scientist who discovered Lyme disease back in the 70s. 40 years later, he's still working to understand more about this disease and treat patients who have it. These days, Dr. Steer is a principal investigator at the Center for Immunology and Inflammatory Diseases, a research institute at the Mass General Hospital, and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Steer talked with us about how Lyme disease shows up in patients and what you need to know if you think you may have been infected by a tick. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Steer to uh, Physician Focus. It's, uh, rare that we have the man that discovered Lyme disease or discovered a, a uh, syndrome as our guest. And you're still practicing 
and yes. you're still researching and uh, uh, you're a hero for doing all of that and it's uh, wonderful that you've taken the time to talk to us here on Physician Focus. Oh, thank you very much. When do I bring my symptoms to a doctor and what symptoms are those that I bring? The most common sign is the slowly expanding redness that occurs at the site of the tick bite. So that's what brings most patients to their doctor. It's what brings most patients to the doctor. Uh, the skin lesion starts after an incubation period. Uh, that so in other words, you've had the, the tick bite already. Yes. A couple days later, the tick's fallen off. A couple days later, it can be a couple of weeks later. Redness forms at the site and it expands gradually. That's the most characteristic part is it gets larger. Typically, it's a somewhat redder outer border and with some clearing of the redness towards but the center. When you say gradually, well, it's about one centimeter a day, which so, is not very fast. It's different than an allergic reaction, for example, which typically will enlarge much faster. The infection from this infectious agent uh, does not expand that fast, but it typically does expand some. If the skin lesion just remains small at the site of a tick bite, then that's generally not the infection. There are typically some other symptoms that go along with the rash, not always, but typically. And most commonly, headache, neck stiffness in the back of the neck, some joint pain, some muscle pain. We use the expression malaise, just feeling somewhat sick. Um, those are the symptoms that most commonly go along with the skin lesion. Uh, but not all patients have the skin lesion. About four in five patients do, but that means one in five do not. And that sort of patient may still have what we call the flu-like symptoms. So what will a doctor typically do at this stage? How will they uh, nail down the diagnosis and what do we need to know? The doctor will look at, listen to the story. The time of year is important uh, because this is something that usually occurs in the summer. And we'll look at whether that skin lesion looks characteristic of Lyme disease. Now, particularly if it's recognized early, it may not have expanded so much yet. And the physician may not be sure but the temptation, if you think it's Lyme disease, is just go ahead and treat with a course of antibiotic therapy. At that point, two to three weeks of antibiotic therapy is generally sufficient to treat the infection. Did I have Lyme at that point, or do we, we care, or do I, do yeah. I need a diagnostic test? There is a blood test for Lyme disease. The problem in early disease is that it may not be positive in the first several weeks. Patients worry about other diseases uh, carried by the ticks. I yes. Mean, uh, well, how, the, how do we deal with that? In the, know, the, the same tick can transmit other infectious agents. In fact, we're now up to s the possibility of six different infectious agents that can be transmitted by the tick. By the way, not all of them occur in this area in the state of Massachusetts. So um, we're not worried about all of those, but the others tend to also cause flu-like illnesses with fever, uh, neck stiffness, headache, being potential parts, joint pain, muscle pain. So one really cannot sort out easily from just the symptoms uh, if there is a co-infecting agent. Fortunately, most of these infections respond to the same antibiotic that we exactly. use for the treatment of Lyme disease. So uh, it's usually not a problem. Um, so what do I do when I'm presenting with a tick bite? Yes. Um, if Is the, it all right for my doc to give me uh, a short uh, uh, yeah, two pills of doxycycline, for example? There, there are studies that show that that reduces the risk of, of Lyme disease if the two pills are given within 72 hours of tick attachment. So, yes, I think the, the hardest part is people are not sure necessarily what tick bit them or even if a tick bit them and 
can be nervous about this and then should I have antibiotic therapy? Um, that's a judgment decision on the part of the physician and the patient. In discussing um, uh, antibiotic treatment, uh, we mentioned that in adults, it's, it's a good idea, or sometimes a good idea, to take two uh, doxycycline when you've been yes. bitten. This isn't always a good idea for children, you Generally, you we're not giving doxycycline to children under age eight. There are more recent studies about that, but I think still the general practice is not to give doxycycline to young children. Um, the drug that's generally used for the treatment of early Lyme disease in young children is amoxicillin. Before I came to do this interview, I talked to a group of my uh, primary care physician friends yes. and asked them, uh, I said, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Steer. What would you have him know, have the public know about uh, Lyme disease? And their answer was, please tell my patients they don't have to stay on antibiotics forever, that these other manifestations of Lyme disease have to be treated separately. Is that fair? Well, I think it's important to know that Lyme disease untreated, the natural history of the disease, is a disease that generally occurs in stages. And we've been talking about stage one, the initial skin lesion that often occurs at the site of the tick bite. Uh, that's generally quite easy to treat. Uh, the later manifestations of the disease can be serious, can be somewhat more difficult in that there can be multiple different causes rather than uh, just Lyme disease being the cause. So let me give some examples of that. Um, within several weeks after the initial skin lesion, Neurologic Untreated. 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 Neurologic. Untreated, you're, no. you're practically never goes That's on right. to anything else. That's right. This is untreated. Okay. Uh, neurologic involvement may develop, uh, and one of the most common features is so-called facial palsy, in which half the face becomes paralyzed, or even the, the whole face. And it may be associated with meningitis, which is infection, inflammation in the lining of the brain. It can be associated with severe headache, uh, pain radiating in, in nerves that are affected that can be affected in the arms or the legs. Paralysis can develop in those extremities as well. Uh, but again, Lyme disease is not the only disease that can cause meningitis or facial palsy, and a physician would need to try to sort that out. It's in untreated patients that about 15% can develop neurologic involvement within those weeks after the initial onset of the infection. Still in this period of early disseminated infection, heart involvement may occur. In untreated patients, it's about 5%. So it's an unusual course of Lyme disease, but it can be quite serious in that it can be associated with what we call complete heart block. But it means generally that the heart's beating considerably slower because of that. And so it can cause fainting. In other words, syncopal episodes. And uh, again, it generally is something that one might see in July or August. So we covered stage one, the skin lesion, stage two, neurologic or heart involvement. And so now, We'll get out to stage three. So we're almost, uh, um, these are like almost separate diseases. They are almost like separate diseases with different potential confounding diagnoses. What I mean by that, other, th other diseases that could Can cause mimic that. a similar clinical picture. So stage three, arthritis is the most common manifestation. Months later, it could be three months later, six months later, 12 months later, that one develops joint involvement. And the most common picture is to have a swollen knee. But a single joint. Well, one or two, one or both knees would be most common. Now it can be other joints, but generally only one or a few joints at a time. But even in untreated patients, generally 
the arthritis goes away. I'm not, uh, my approach is you, you've got chronic fatigue. Whether Lyme caused it or not uh, is, is something that we need to work up. What would you say in terms of what we know vis-a-vis -vis, uh, say a chronic antibiotic treatment for these post-infectious syndromes or the... Uh, it, is, it is important to know that Lyme disease, this infection, can be followed by various post-infectious phenomena. And this can include that fatigue or, or joint pain persists somewhat longer after the course of antibiotic therapy for the infection. Generally, it will improve and go away, but not always. There are people who do have uh, persistent symptoms that can even last for years after having had the infection. There have been studies of those patients. In fact, we have five such studies of those patients now which have not shown benefit from additional courses of antibiotic therapy. Certainly, treating chronic pain is difficult and many people wonder, do I have chronic Lyme disease? Is Borrelia burgdorferi the Lyme disease agent? What triggered this? Uh, though it's possible, though that's a possible reason, it's usually not the reason. Other infections, other uh, traumatic events may trigger these types of syndromes. So the, it triggers something, but it's not, the infection is gone. That's right. The infection is gone. You have made a bunch of my primary care physician friends ecstatic by this comment because we would so like to dispel the myth that you need to stay on antibiotics. It just can't be good for you. Thanks again to our featured experts, Dr. Katherine Brown and Dr. Alan Steer. Now go enjoy our beautiful Massachusetts summer. Just don't forget to use a tick repellent and do your daily tick check. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin for Physician Focus. Thanks for watching.